dedicated to my wife, Fannie Lou Hamer. When people think of the civil rights movement of the 1960s, they often think first of the educated male leaders such as Martin Luther King Jr. Some of the most important work was done by poor, uneducated women. Fannie Lou Hamer reached national fame through her courage and determination to fight for basic civil rights. She was born Fannie Lou Townsend in 1917 in Montgomery County, Mississippi. She was the granddaughter of a slave, and although slavery had been abolished for more than 50 years, her family lived just one step above slavery. Her parents were sharecroppers. They farmed a plot of land on the plantation for the plantation owner, who received a percentage of the crops harvested. The rest they kept for themselves. But the house they lived on belonged to the plantation. They bought their seed and other supplies from the plantation, as well as the food they could not grow themselves, like coffee and flour and sugar. By the time they finished paying the owner for all that, there was very little left over for them. What they did manage to keep for themselves had to be stretched very far. Fannie Lou was the last of 20 children in a family of six girls and 14 boys. Although as the baby of the family, she was very much loved. She did not have a happy childhood. She contracted polio when she was young. There was no vaccine for polio in those days, and her family had no money for doctors. She survived the disease, but it left her with a limp. The limp and her short stature did not prevent her from standing tall as a person. One thing her mother taught her at an early age was to stand up no matter what the odds. She went to work in the fields at the age of six, large-boned and sturdily built. She proved to be a strong worker. Fanny once said, I can remember very well the landowner telling me one day that if I would pick 30 pounds, he would pick me something out of the commissary, some Cracker Jacks, Daddy Wide Legs, or some sardines. These were things that he knew I loved and never had a chance to have. So I picked 30 pounds that day. Well, the next week, I had to pick 60. And by the time I was 13, I was picking 200, 2 and 300 pounds. It was backbreaking work, for picking cotton meant cleaning each cotton plant of its ripe bowls, starting from the top and working down. Dragging a long bag behind her, Fanny moved slowly along a row, not even noticing the nicks and cuts in her toughened hands caused by the sharp edges of the outer casing of the bowl. But Fanny and all the other children had to work to help out the family. Her parents once tried to farm for themselves, but a white man killed all their mules and they had to go back to sharecropping. Fanny had little schooling. My parents tried so hard to do what they could do to keep us in school, but school for black children didn't last but from four months out of the year. And most of the time, we didn't have clothes to wear. I dropped out of the school and cut corn stalks to help the family. Fanny got married in 1944 at the age of 27 to <clears throat> Perry Hamer, who she called Pap. She moved in with him at the Marlowe Plantation in Ruleville, Mississippi, where he had lived for 12 years. As sharecroppers on that plantation, the Hamers were given a furnish, a small house, and a credit card and credit against their work at the plantation store. Despite Hamer's lack of schooling, she was smart and a trustworthy worker. Eventually, she became a plantation timekeeper, keeping track of the hours each worker put in and letting the other workers know when it was time to take a break, when it was time to return to work, and when it was time to quit. Hamer interrupted her work only twice. To have children? The local white doctor did not believe that black women should have a lot of children and took it upon himself to sterilize Fanny. Fanny did not realize at the same time that the surgery he performed meant that she could never have another child. By the time she did realize what he had done, it was too late. People who knew and worked with her in later years described her as having large, sad eyes. Lot happened to her in her life to be sad about. In spite of all the hardships she endured, Fanny Lou Hamer had a strong sense of her own self-worth. 
She was proud of her ability to work hard and felt she was just as good as the next person, black or white. She resented the segregation under which she lived all her life and felt she was entitled to all the rights of this citizenship. As she put it, just knowing things wasn't right. In 1975, she recalled the times when she and her family had moved into a house on the Marlow Plantation that had previously been lived in by a white family. The house had a bathroom, but it wasn't working. When she asked that it be fixed, Marlowe told her she didn't need it. And several weeks after that, said Hamer, I was over to their house cleaning up a bathroom, and his daughter told me she was an eleven little she was a little girl then. She told me I didn't have to take too much pains in that room because that was old honey's bathroom and that was their dog. I was mad enough to boil when I left that house. And I went home and I told Pap. I said, now they got the dog higher than us. Hamer did not keep her feelings to herself, but talked freely in the fields about the conditions under which she and the other workers lived. Since that kind of talk was dangerous, some of the others said she didn't have good sense, but for many years she did not know how to do more than talk. She had no idea how to fight for her rights. She was no different from the most black people in the South. The U.S. political system allowed, allows people to make changes through voting. But in the South, the system for voting was controlled by whites, who passed laws making it nearly impossible for blacks to register. For many years, black people could not register to vote unless they had a white person to vouch for them. Few whites were willing to vouch for blacks, since they did not want them to have the vote. That law was struck down in the 1940s, but whites came up with other ways to keep blacks from getting the vote. They started requiring a written test, knowing that many blacks could not read or write well enough to pass it. Sometimes even a black person who passed the test was told that she or he had not. Those who passed the test then had to pay to poll taxes back to the time when they were 21 years old, which a lot of black people could not afford. There were many other indignities, like segregated schools and segregated buses. In the mid-1950s in Montgomery, the capital of Alabama, blacks were especially angered over their treatment on the segregated buses. They could only sit in the back of the bus, and when the bus became crowded, they had to give up the back seats to whites who were standing. In 1955, a seamstress in Montgomery named Rosa Parks refused to give up her bus seat to a white man and was arrested. Her arrest sparked a black boycott of the Montgomery buses. A young Baptist minister named Martin Luther King Jr. emerged as a leader of the boycott, which was finally successful after more than a year. The United States Supreme Court ruled that segregation of the buses was unconstitutional. Martin Luther King Jr. and other Southern ministers believed that they could win more battles against segregation through boycotts and other forms of nonviolent protest. They formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC, to work for change in the South. Not long afterward, in 1960, black college students in Greensboro, North Carolina began their own nonviolent campaign with, against segregation at lunch counters in the city. The former protest they chose was a sit-in. They sat at the lunch counters until they were served or arrested and taken away by the police. Other college students did the same thing, and soon they formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the SNCC. Both the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee believed that if blacks could vote, they could bring about more changes. They both launched voter registration drives in different parts of the South. The SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, con concentrated on Alabama. The Student Nonviolent, Nonviolent Coordinating Committee chose Mississippi as the focus of its campaign. Fannie Lou Hamer had been following the progress of what was now being called the Civil Rights Movement. In 
when young SNCC workers came to Ruleville to try to get blacks to register to vote, she was willing to try, even though she knew it meant great danger. She was then 44 years old and had worked on the Marlowe Plantation for 18 years. She explained later, one day, one day early in August, I heard that some young people had come to town teaching people how to register to vote. I have always wanted to do something to help myself and my race, but I did not know how to go about it. So I went to one of those meetings in Ruleville. That night, I was showed how to fill out a form for registration. The next day, August 31st, 1962, I went to Indianola, Mississippi to fill out a form at the registrar's office. I took the test. The registrar gave Hamer a book containing the Mississippi Constitution and told her to copy the 16th section of it. She copied it. Then he asked her to tell him what it meant. She flunked. That night when she returned home, she learned that Marlowe, the landowner, had been telling everybody in the field what would happen if she tried to register again. That night, Marlowe came to the house where I was staying and called Mr. Hamer to the door. I could hear him telling my husband what he was going to do to me if I did not withdraw my registration. So I went to the door. Marlo asked my husband if he had told me what he had said. Marlo saw me in the door and asked me why I went to register. I told him that I did it for myself, not for him. He told me to get off the plantation and don't be seen near it again. That night I left the plantation and went to stay with Mr. and Mrs. Tucker in Ruleville. Her husband had to remain on the plantation until the work was done. Whites were prepared to use any means necessary to keep blacks from voting. On September 10, 1962, night Riders fired 16 shots into the Tucker's house. Fortunately for Hamer, she was not in the house that night, for shots hit the bedroom wall one foot above where her head normally rested. She would not be frightened off. In early December, she found a three-room house to rent, and she and her family moved into it. Next day, she went back <clears throat> to try to again to register to vote. She studied the Mississippi Constitution and this time was able to interpret the section given to her. Now that she had registered to vote, she wanted others to do the same. She agreed to work with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee the SNCC, and she became one of their most energetic field secretaries traveling across the South. On June 9, 1963, she and five other SNCC and Southern Christian Leadership Conference workers were returning by bus to Greenwood, Mississippi for a meeting in South Carolina. When the bus stopped in Winona, Mississippi, some of the workers went into the white waiting room. Amor was not one of them. The local police arrived and arrested the whole group, including Fannie Lou Hamer, who had just stepped off the bus to see what was going on. In the Winona jail, they were all placed in one cell at first. Then a young woman named Anel Ponder, an SCLC voter education teacher who was stationed in Mississippi, was taken from the cell. The others heard her screaming and realized that she was being beaten. Hamer remembered hearing Anel screaming and crying and at the time praying out loud for God to forgive the men who were beating her. Then Hamer was taken from the cell and brought to another cell. Three white men and two black prisoners were there. A white man handed a blackjack to one of the prisoners and ordered him to make Hamer wish she was dead. While the white man held her down, the prisoner beat her all over her body. Then the prisoner took over with the blackjack. The hammer tried to protect her head with her hand. She was beaten until her fingers were blue. The skin off her back swelled up and turned hard with welts. When the beating was finished, Hamer could not even walk. Other SNCC staff arrived in Winona and paid the bail for Hamer and the others. The SNCC lawyers filed suit against the Winona police for the arrests and beatings. The case came to trial. The following December, Hamer and the other SNCC workers testified about what had happened. The white owner of the restaurant at the bus stop and the white waitress who had been there the night of the arrests both testified. So did the two black prisoners. An FBI agent 
who had taken pictures of Hamer and the others after they had been beaten, showed those pictures to the court. But in spite of all the evidence against them, all the whites who had been charged were found not guilty. The verdict did not surprise Hamer. It was the same Southern justice she had known her whole life, but it just made her more determined to bring about change in Mississippi. She remained based in Ruleville, although she often traveled to other cities and towns. In March 1964, a friend who was still working on the Marlowe Plantation warned her that he'd heard someone say, Mrs. Hamer thinks she is a big woman now, but she'll be killed. This was not the only threat she had received against her life, but she didn't back down. In fact, she was one of the most determined SNCC workers. She would often wake everyone else up by saying, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. Whenever something happened that moved her, she would stand up and sing her favorite spiritual. This time, light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. The other SNCC workers, who were mostly college students and college graduates, and who were both black and white, found her to be a natural leader. In spite of her lack of education, as one white female SNCC per worker put it, Mrs. Hamer is more educated than I am. That is, she knows more. She was never afraid to speak her mind. One time, a group in Illinois was, that was sympathetic to the civil rights movement and the poor people of Mississippi sent a truckload of clothing. Hamer made plans to distribute it. On that day, the mayor of Ruleville announced on the radio that clothing was being given away and where to go to get it. His plan was that a large crowd would gather and become unruly, unruly, making Mrs. Hamer and the SNCC look as if they couldn't organize even a simple clothing distribution. Sure enough, a large crowd gathered. Worried Fanny Hamer called the local SNCC office and asked what she should do and was told to handle the situation as best she could. She walked over to the crowd and said, The mayor can't tell Negroes what to do. If you all would just sit down and go to the courthouse to register to vote, we wouldn't have a mayor doing things like this to us. She managed to calm the crowd and distribute the clothing in an orderly way. 1964 was an election year in Mississippi. All the candidates on the ballot were white. The SNCC voting right workers decided to put up four local black leaders as writing candidates. Voters could write these names on the ballots instead of voting for any of the official candidates. No one expected the writing candidates to win, but SNCC felt it was a way to get publicity for their cause. Fanny Hamer agreed to be a writing candidate. She spent most of the late winter and spring attending meetings in different parts of the county, urging black people to register and to vote for her. After the June 2 primary, which of course none of the black candidates won, she and several voters tried to attend a local precinct meeting of the Democratic Party. They found the door locked. They were not surprised. The, NS, the SNCC had already decided to form its own Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, the MFDP. The SNCC declared that summer to be it to be Mississippi Freedom Summer, and that it would do everything possible to get blacks registered. More than a thousand volunteers, many white and from the North, arrived in Mississippi to work in the campaign. In June, two young white men named Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner arrived in Mississippi and were picked up by a local black rights civil worker named James Cheney. He was to drive them to SNCC headquarters. The three were murdered, murdered by local whites and their bodies buried in the side of a dam in Meridian, Mississippi. At the Democratic National Convention at Atlantic City that August, Fanny Hamer and other MFDP delegates attempted to challenge the regular Mississippi delegation as not being representative of the people of Mississippi. Several other state delegations supported their challenge. Fanny Hamer made a speech before the Credentials Committee saying, If the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hook because our lives being threatened daily? She told how blacks in Mississippi were prevented from voting from attending precinct meetings meetings 
from the most basic forms of democracy. She told about how she had been beaten in Winona the year before. Then she broke down and wept. National Democratic leaders offered a compromise. They would give the MFDP two seats and promised that from then on the regular Mississippi delegation would never again be all white. But Hamer would not accept the compromise. Martin Luther King Jr. urged her to change her mind. So did many other black leaders, black and white, but she refused. The regular Mississippi delegation was seated. No MFDP delegates were officially recognized at the convention. That fall, Hamer led the MFDP challenge to the seating of the Mississippi congressional delegation when the new session of Congress opened. Once again, they were not successful. With, with each challenge, they caused more people to think about how much the southern states had excluded blacks from participating as equal citizens. In 1965, Congress passed and President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act that empowered federal registrars to register black votes in the South. Fanny Hamer and the other the MFDP believed their work had helped bring about the new law. In September 1964, Mrs. Hamer and a group of other SNCC workers went to Guinea, the second African nation to become independent as guests from the government. For Hamer, who had not even traveled outside of Mississippi very often, it was an exciting experience. Being from the South, we never was taught much about our African heritage, wrote Hamer in her autobiography to praise our bridges. The way everybody talked to us, everybody in Africa was savages and really stupid people. But I've seen more savage white folks here in America than I've seen in Africa. I saw black men flying the airplanes, driving buses, sitting behind the big desks in the banks and just doing everything that I was used to seeing white people do. I saw, for the first time in my life, a black stewardess walk, walking through the plane, and that was quite an, an inspiration for me. But rapid change was coming to the American South. By, by the following year, Mississippi Magazine had named Fannie Lou Hamer as one of the six women of influence in the state. In the early 1970s, Ruleville held a Fannie Lou Hamer Day, and the white mayor said she would go down in history as a champion of her people. By 1965, representatives of white candidates were visiting her at the small brick house where she and Pap lived in Ruleville to ask her for support. That winter, Hamer's health began to fail, but she worked hard in 1976 to unite the black and white factions of the Mississippi Democratic Party so that a single integrated delegation could represent the state in 1976. Democratic National Convention in New York. She died of cancer on March 15, 1977, at the age of 60. At her funeral, Andrew Young, a leader in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC, who would later become U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations and Mayor of Atlanta, Georgia, said, Women were the spine of our movement. It was women going door to door speaking with neighbors, meeting in voter registration classes together, organizing through their churches that gave the vital mom momentum and energy to the movement. Mrs. Hammer Hamer was special, but she also, but she was also representative. The stout woman with a limp and the big, sad eyes who lacked an education and had experienced so much pain in her life would not have wanted to be remembered as either special or representative. She would have wanted to be remembered simply as someone who had known things weren't right and who had done her best to do something about it. The end.